Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning for the online worship service of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ. A few quick announcements as we get started this morning. If you would like to help support the ministry of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ, you can do so by sending either your tithes or your offerings to the address on the screen beside me. You can also find that address on PleasantGroveChurchOfChrist.com along with much, much more for your spiritual growth and development. The other day, I went into my son Davy's room to get him dressed and was surprised to find him standing on top of his dresser. I'm not sure what his plan was if I hadn't walked in when I did. If it was anything like he does when he stands on the arm of the couch, it probably involved some heroic leap to his death, this time without the soft couch cushions to catch him. Davy may have too much confidence in his own ability to survive. Meanwhile, Tabby, my daughter, still chooses to crawl around in a three-legged stance. One of the moms at the park just the other day so that it seems like she knows how to walk, she just doesn't have the confidence to do it. Tab may need a bit more confidence for her to be able to try new things that she's never done before. Now, both our kids, they have an equal level of confidence in one area. They both think that I, their dad, can do anything. Unfortunately, almost two weeks ago now, I, I felt my lower back going out. And since then, I've had to recognize my own limitations. I've had to be careful carrying my son Davy up the stairs or, or lifting my daughter Tabitha out of her car seat or even for that matter, getting down on the floor to play with my children. They still have confidence that their dad can do anything, though. Regrettably, misplaced confidence. In our, in our world, we're told confidence is king. If we're confident, even if we make a mistake, those around us will trust us and follow our lead. And yet, the writer of Hebrews tells us if our confidence is based in who we are, it's misplaced. The writer puts it this way in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Misplaced confidence can be disastrous. Too many in our world place their confidence in themselves, their friends, or the good things that they've done in their lives, thinking they've got everything figured out. In a sense, that they're made right with God because of who they are and what they've done. But it's not who we are and what we've done that makes us right with God. It's who Jesus is and what he has done that matters. The writer of Hebrews tells us Jesus is our great high priest. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, the writer transitions to a discussion about the priesthood of Jesus. And through the end of Chapter 7, the writer unfolds the various aspects of who Jesus is and what he has done as our great high priest. Throughout the next several weeks, we're going to examine what the writer says about Jesus' priesthood. 
But for this week, we'll see how great Jesus really is by the list of traits that the writer shares with us in chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, that we've already read this morning. Our great high priest ascended into heaven. Jesus performed his priestly duties in the very presence of his heavenly Father. For a moment, bear with me as I get a little bit theological. We might wonder why it matters that Jesus served his heavenly Father in heaven and not just on earth like any other priest. This can get a bit complicated, but it's important. And so let's talk about types and shadows. Theologically speaking, a type is a heavenly reality, while a shadow is something in our world that represents that reality. As a physical example, say you wanted to know my dad, but you've never had the opportunity to actually meet him. To some extent, you do know something about him because you know me. I exhibit some of who he is. I'm even told that now that I'm sporting a beard, that I look a bit like him. He must have been strikingly good-looking when he was my age. It's okay to laugh. When I came to the Old Testament priesthood, everything about, about it was just a shadow of the reality in heaven. The temple, the altar, the rituals, the sacrifices, the holy holy of holies, it all pointed God's people to what would take place when Jesus ascended into heaven to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. When Jesus fulfilled his duties as our great high priest, he not only crossed the gulf that stood between us and our Heavenly Father, but he bridged it for us to join him in God's presence. No Old Testament priest, a mere shadow, could have ever done what Jesus did. Our great high priest is also described as Jesus. I know that's that's kind of obvious since throughout this series of sermons we've been talking about the portrait of Christ that the writer of Hebrews paints for us. And so why mention Jesus, Jesus' name when we're clearly talking about him? Well, some commentators think that the writer of Hebrews mentions Jesus' proper name to emphasis to emphasize his humanity while calling him Christ elsewhere to emphasize his divinity. In most cases, this would hold true, but not always, even throughout the few pages of the book of Hebrews. So, it's more likely that the writer's use of Jesus' proper name emphasizes what he did to save us from our sins while elsewhere the title of Christ is used when our service to Jesus is what's being discussed. Jesus served us on the cross, and we serve him as the Christ, the chosen one of God. But he wasn't simply just one chosen among many. Our great high priest is the Son of God. We talked quite a bit about the sonship of God in our sermon a few weeks back, Higher Than Angels. And so today, I won't go into it all again here. I'll limit my comments to this. The message given to us by God's Son supersedes all other messages given by God's servants, whether by the prophets or by even angels. If you want to hear more about the superiority of the Son of God, I encourage you to go back and listen to that second sermon in this series once again. Jesus is the Son of God. Our great high priest was tempted in every way, just like us, yet he didn't sin. 
Have you ever thought about that? How remarkable that really is? He did not, he not only was tempted, but he was tempted in every way, just like us. In fact, more so than us. It's hard for us to imagine how powerful temptation may become because we generally cave into it when it's in a weaker form. It hasn't even reached its climax. But Jesus, having never sinned, was still tempted in every way and overcame it. Our great high priest is able to empathize with our weaknesses. In case you might think that the high priest who is so great, is great enough to enter the presence of God, might be too great to relate to us and our weaknesses, the writer makes sure that we know that Jesus can empathize with our struggles. When Jesus took on flesh, he didn't simply look like us physically, but he took on all of our weaknesses, all the weaknesses of becoming finite. In Jesus' weakness, he had to rely on his heavenly Father even more. Perfection is only possible by leaning on the perfection wholeheartedly of God in our weakness. Paul explained it this way in his own life when he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It's important that we distinguish something at this point. There's a big difference between weakness of faith, where God's power is able to be seen as Paul addresses in this passage, and a lack of faith where there is nothing but hardness of heart and rebellion. God grieves weakness, wanting us to grow in him. Hardness and rebellion, on the other hand, anger him. He helps the weak. He expels the disobedient. To the one, he offers mercy and grace. To the other, he promises harsh judgment. Jesus gets us. He understands our weaknesses and offers us God's mercy and grace if we'll seek him in obedience. Based on who we are, or based on who our great high priest is, the one who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, tempted in every way as we are, and able to empathize with us in our weakness, as his followers, we are told generally to hold firmly to the faith we profess, and more specifically, to approach the throne of grace with confidence. Proper confidence isn't based on us, but on our great high priest and what he has done on our behalf. The Apostle John helps us to understand what the writer of Hebrews means by approach the throne of grace in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. John writes, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Writing to those who had given their lives to Jesus, John encouraged them to confidently go before the Father in prayer. Yet many of us only pray when we find ourselves in a mess, praying about the symptoms of our problems rather than the heart behind our problems. We, don't, we tend to not pray for God's strength to overcome our weaknesses, praying instead because we fell to our weaknesses and we're struggling once again with the consequences. Theologian William Law 
explained it this way. More skepticism may be traced to a neglected prayer closet than to the arguments of infidels or the halls of secularists. First, men depart from God, then they deny him. And therefore, for the most part, unbelief will not yield to clever sermons on the evidences, but to home thrusts that pierce the points of the harness to the soul within. The hardest hearts were soft once, and the softest may get hard. As followers of Christ, we have two choices. We can either focus on ourselves and be condemned by our own hearts, or we can focus on our great high priest and be confident to approach God's throne and receive mercy and find grace. I love the way the writer of Hebrews put that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We receive God's compassion. He is not giving us what we deserve, and we find what we did nothing to earn, his grace. It all happens when we need it most in our time of need, and that's huge. When we struggle to pray right, even think right, or even know the right time to cry out to God, he reaches out to us through our great high priest. God understands the clumsy cry of our hearts, and he gives us the help we need when we need it. If we could see our lives clearly, the burdens we bear aren't something to simply face. But there are opportunities that bring us confidently to the mercy and grace of God. This is true whether it's our own need we're lifting up before our Heavenly Father or the needs of someone else near us. Jesus' work as our high priest wasn't simply to transform us into his people, but to use us as his people to meet the needs of others by our perceptive prayers on their behalf. But there is a crucial limitation to our prayers, though. God leaves it up to us to pray. He helps us when we approach him with confidence, but he doesn't force us into praying when we don't choose to make it a priority in our lives. In turn, many of the needs in our lives and in the lives of those around us simply go unanswered because we never ask God to act. And that's the real problem. Forgetting our high priest and what he's done, we lack the confidence to ask God to act. Today, my challenge for you is this. Take time as you pray to focus on your great high priest and what he has done for you, and then confidently lift the needs in your life and in the lives of those around you, knowing that God will answer according to his will. My hope is that you will do that this week during your own prayer time. Now, if you, if you don't have a regular prayer time, make this week the week that you begin. Find a time where you can focus on Jesus, focus on God, and recognize who Jesus is as our great high priest and what he has done for you. And take that time to lift your needs and the needs of those around you up to your Heavenly Father, that he may respond according to his will. This brings us to a time of communion, a time when we gather together to remember 
the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. A few weeks ago, I, I started a series of communion meditations focusing on the words of Jesus on the cross, and today we'll continue in that series as we read a passage, as we read a passage of Scripture from Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 46. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he has said this, he breathed his last. Today we focus on the words of Jesus, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Even in that moment, as Jesus was about to breathe his last, he, he expressed his, his love, his honor, his glory for his Father. And into his hands he committed his spirit. There was a trust there a trust that each and every one of us as followers of Christ should have as we come into God's presence confidently, as we've spoken of even today. And so as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, his broken body and his shed blood there on the cross, we remember how what he has done gives us that confidence to come before his Father. We may not, in this coming week, speak these words that Jesus spoke, but we may say something to the effect of, Father, into your hands I commit this situation in my life, this struggle in my life, this, this relationship in my life, this possession, this career, whatever it may be, this struggle, this sin. And so in these moments, I, I ask that you would pray these words of Jesus. Father, into your hands I commit whatever that may be. In this moment, let's take of the bread that reminds us of Jesus' broken body there on the cross. And the juice that represents his shed blood, the blood of forgiveness for each and every one of us. And let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we are able to be together, that we are able to lift up our prayers confidently to you. And Father, as we pray together, as the body of Christ, I pray the words of Jesus, Father, into your hands I commit. And then each of us, we fill in our own situation, our own struggle, our own sin, our own career, our own choices, or job, or home, or possessions, or relationship, whatever that may be. Father, we give it to you, and we ask for your strength, your power, and whatever that may be, that we would be overcomers like Christ, that we would trust you as our Heavenly Father, turn to you in our weakness. And Father, we pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. I thank you for the opportunity of being together with you this morning. And I look forward to the next time, either in person during our Sunday school hour each Sunday at 930
or our worship time during our in-person worship at the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ in Southeast Minnesota. Or, once again, right back here online at 11 a.m. each Sunday morning and then repost it on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our website. I look forward to being with you once again. God bless and stay well.